God's in this place. I will tell you, it doesn't matter what you need. God's here. And there's nothing that you need that he can't supply. He's faithful. Wow. I'm going to do this. Go ahead and be seated in the presence of the Lord. We're going to, we'll be back up in shortly. We're not going to be long. Well, long is relative. (laughs) It's an eternal gospel. (laughs) Thanks, guys. You're awesome, man. I can take you guys home with me. Okay, <laughs> come on. Everybody feel pretty good right now? Yeah. Whew, Jesus is in this place. My goodness. I really believe that there are times when there's an open door to step through, and sometimes we can get caught up in doing church a certain way, and I never want to get into a routine where it has to be a certain way. Sometimes God just wants to explode right in the middle of who knows what's going on. And I like it that way. I, I, I love a church where you never know what's going to happen. Does that feel good? I think it should be that way. I, like, like we have, a, we have a plan, but God has this idea that church ought to be about him. <laughs> I think it's an amazing idea. <laughs> Whew, everybody feel pretty good? Yeah. Bless the Lord. I feel like my pants are falling, but I got a new belt for Christmas, and it's made up of watches all the way around. It's a waste of time. <laughs> Never mind. That's not true. Okay. <laughs> Some of you will get that tomorrow. Okay. Everything shifted for me in, in worship. How about you? You guys feel this? Because I, 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 I'm, I'm going to go a certain direction, but I'm probably going to shift directions partway through because I felt like the Lord was taking me someplace a little different than what I planned. But here's what I do know. See, Amos chapter 3, verse 3, it says this. It says, can two walk together except they be agreed? You guys familiar with that verse? Can two walk together except they be agreed? Here's the reality. Can you walk with truth if you don't agree with truth? Do you understand what I just said? We can't walk with the word if we're not in agreement with the word. So I I can either agree. Boy, I'm going to talk to you real plain. Sometimes people have spoken stuff over us, and we've come into agreement with what they said rather than what God said. Do you understand what I just said? i got to find out what God says about me and come into agreement with what heaven says about me. I want to be able to see you the way heaven sees you. Do you understand what I just said? That's why Paul said, now we see no man after the flesh. Now we know no man after the flesh. Why? Because we're not seeing people in the flesh. We're seeing them as God sees them. We've got to see people the way heaven sees them. So sometimes even when people are rascals or maybe they're not living such a good life or whatever, rather than see them and marking them for what their actions are doing, how do we see them the way heaven sees them? Does that make sense to anybody? You guys follow what I'm saying? And that's really a place where we've got to try to learn. Teach me, Lord, how to see what you see. I was at a place called New Life for Girls. I was preaching to a group of girls that were graduating from a a drug rehab. There was about 75, 80 of them in the the building. And I just, they didn't tell me there was a time limit. So, no, no, I don't mean here. I mean in in New Life for Girls, right? And and here's, here's what happened. I took off preaching like a wild man. And I preached this message called Unlabeled. I wrote it for them. And I talked about how the world tries to label us. Failure addict, alcoholic. Do you follow me? And, 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 the, and the world will try to label you. But here's the deal. I was in a grocery store, and it's a true story. I was in a grocery store. Uh, we call it Nell's Market. It's a little grocery store chain around our, our little community. There's about four Nell's grocery stores. If, like a sure find, if you're familiar with that. It'd be like, uh, what do you guys got down here? Pete and, uh, um, Publix. Publix. You know what I mean? You guys got Publix down here? Okay, good. Uh, all right. Anyway, it's kind of similar to that. It's a chain, right? And, uh, and I, I, I'm in there, and there's, there's green beans, like in cans, the Del Monte green beans and all that kind of stuff. And there's corn, and there was a little space in between, and there's a can there with no label on it. And you know what? I didn't know if it was corn or green beans. Do you understand what happened? Right? And I began looking at that, and I thought, I wonder which side this is supposed to be on. Because there was green beans here, there was corn here. And this can, without a label, was sitting right in the middle. And I thought, I wonder if that's corn. I wonder if that's green beans. I wonder what that really is. And you know what? I could have got a magic marker, a marker out, you know what I mean, and wrote on it corn. But that wouldn't have made it corn. I could have wrote on it green beans, but it wouldn't have made it green beans. You know why? Because I didn't really know what was in the can. You know why? I wasn't the manufacturer. The only one who had a right to put a label on it was the manufacturer. I don't know if you guys got that, but that was like drop the mic right there. Do you understand? 
You, you understand what I just said? Come on. Because the world might label you failure. The world might la- label you. Come on. We can, we can walk this thing out. Label you an addict. Label you a prostitute. Label you whatever. And the reality is, is they don't have a right to label you. Why? They weren't your manufacturer. If you really want to know who you are, look in the Word of God and He'll tell you who you are. Why? Because you are who God says you are and you have what God says you have. Don't miss that. Well, I didn't plan on going there, but we got there. Here's what I know. I feel like I got to come into agreement with the Word of God. I got to agree with what God says. But I have to agree not just with my head. How many of you know this ain't a head thing? This is a heart thing. Who's ever been here? And I'm just going to be really open and plain because you guys are pretty, you're pretty solid and you understand when I talk this way, but here's the reality. What do you do when your experience doesn't line up with your theology? Right? Can we talk really plain? Come on. Okay. I'm just going to talk to you really plain. I believe this. This is what I believe. Okay. So I'm just going to tell you what I believe. The Bible tells me in Mark chapter 16, I can lay my hands on the sick and the sick will recover. Right? And We've created theologies around that. We prayed for the sick and they didn't recover, and we told them they needed to have more faith. But the reality says, in the Bible, it doesn't say the sick have to have faith. It says I have to have faith. i got to lay my believing hand on the sick, right? These signs will follow them that believe. It didn't say they'll pray for someone who believes. They'll say they'll pray for the sick. So the sick didn't have to have faith. I had to have faith. Does that make sense to anybody, right? i got to lay my believing hand on the sick, and the sick ought to recover. Right? But when the sick didn't recover, we created all kinds of theologies. And we said, well, they got unforgiveness in their heart and they can't get healed until they get forgiven. I don't see that in the life of Jesus. I see Jesus went into the town and they brought the sick unto him and healed them all. Amen. <laughs> and you know how many all meant? All. <laughs> it's like 3,700 and sometimes in the Bible the word all. And you know what it means? All. <laughs> in the Hebrew it actually means all, but in the Greek it means all. Okay. <laughs> Unless you're from the south, then it means y'all. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but, but the reality is, it means all. And, and it says, he gave the disciples power. He said, go into the towns and villages round about and heal the sick they're in. What sick? The sick. Sound like all of them. Right? But when we didn't, our experience didn't line up with our theology, we created experiential theology. I don't want an experiential theology. I want a word-based theology. Am I making sense to anybody in the house? See, if they have to have faith to get healed, how are you going to raise the dead? <laughs> I ain't never seen a dead man with faith. <laughs> come on. So, so I want to come into agreement with what God says. Because here's the reality. Uh, Romans 1, I'm going to say 16, I think I'm right. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Do you know the word gospel literally means good news, right? You guys know this? It's good news. It's, I'm not ashamed of the good news. <laughs> That's what he just said. I'm not ashamed of the, of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation, right? And that word salvation there is soterion, and it really carries with it a whole bunch of really cool stuff. We get the Greek word sozo out of soterion. They're two different words, but they're close. They're closely assimilated, and it means saved, delivered, healed, set free, kept safe and sound, made secure. It's made whole. <laughs> Come on. That's a pretty big definition. And he says it's the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to everyone that believes. And there's the key. What God is really speaking to me about in this new year, and we're building a great big sign for our auditorium, and it just says believe. We're doing everything hashtag believe because, I don't know, that's cool. Okay. <laughs> so, but, but in the process of that, what I find is that I'm actually excited that God's actually raising up some believing believers. Yay. <laughs> believers that actually believe. That actually, oh, oh, well, see, my greatest desire is one day we'll actually believe the songs we sing. <laughs> Come on, that'll be a good day. But it's, it's believing this gospel. It's to everyone that believes, right? Because here's the deal. It's good news. Jesus came to restore us to the state of Adam before the fall. Everybody understand what I just said? Come on. You know what redemption looks like? It looks like I'm standing with Adam in the midst of the garden and we never ate the fruit. Yay. That's a good day. That's what redemption really looks like. 
You have to understand. All right. Genesis 1, 26, 27, we talked a little bit about it. Let us make man in our own image after our own likeness. Does he say that? Was God created in the image, or was Adam created in the image of God? Okay, so Adam looks like God, and I talked about that last night. But then what happened? Genesis 3 happened, and what did he do? They ate the fruit. Should have never ate the fruit. That's a dumb day. Do you realize they had the whole world and just don't eat at one tree? They had one opportunity to mess up and find it. I used to wonder if Adam and Eve were teenagers. Never, never mind. Okay. <laughs> so, so in the midst of that, I shouldn't have said that out loud. Okay. <laughs> but, but, but in the midst of that, right, man falls, and what happens? The image of God is marred in man. It doesn't, man doesn't look like he was created anymore. Go to Genesis 5. Just let me turn there for a minute. I, I want you to see this, because I think it's really important you see this. I'm going to quote it, but I hope I quote it right. I think I'll be right. I'm going to tell you verse 3. So Adam and Eve fall in chapter 3. Chapter 4, Cain kills Abel. Everybody knows that, right? Right? By the way, do you guys know Cain killed Abel with a rock? Because they didn't have a gun problem. They had a sin problem. We don't have a gun problem in our country. We have a sin problem in our country. I'm not, I, I, please don't throw stones at me. I'm just, I'm just telling you. It's, they want to round up all the guns. I'm thinking, what happens if somebody kills someone with a fork? <laughs> <laughs> They'll be rounding up all the forks. We'll get them little plastic sporks like we had when we were in high school. Okay. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh. Chapter 5, verse 3, you know what it says? It says, and I'm going to quote it fairly close. In the King James, it probably says something along this line. And Adam lived 130 years, and he begat a son. Look what it says. After his image and after his likeness. And he called his name Seth. Am I close? Anybody got it? Am I close? Yeah. I want you to catch that for a minute. See, Adam is created in the image of God, but then he falls in sin. Everybody get this? When he falls in sin, what happened? After Adam sinned, now watch, he has a son named Seth, but Adam doesn't look like God anymore, and now Seth is created in the image of Adam. You guys get that? Why? Because now we're born with an Adamic nature. We didn't have that before the fall. So now, every child born in the world has an Adamic nature. What? It's a nature that causes us to be prone to sin. Here's the reality, and I'll talk to you about this real plain for a minute if I can. I hope my son never watches this video. <laughs> okay. But my, 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 my daughter is, is born, and she's four years older than my son. And my son gets born, and here's what happens. He's about 18 months old. We're potty training him. We're teaching him. I'm working in a steel mill at the time, pastor a small church. And, and what happens, I come home from work, and my little boy comes busting out the door to see Daddy. And he goes, Daddy's home, Daddy's home. And he's running toward me, and I got my lunchbox in my hand. I put my lunchbox out. I grab my boy. I pick him up like this, and I go to hug him, and I'm telling you, the boy reeked. Everybody understands reeked, right? I'm telling you, his britches were loaded terrible. And I looked at him, and we were potty training him. His name's Josh. I said, Josh, who messed in your pants? 18 months old, right? Why? I'm trying to teach him responsibility. He looks at me with the biggest, brownest eyes and says, Nicole. <laughs> now, that's his older sister. And I'm thinking, well, she's getting punished. Okay. <laughs> Here's the reality. I asked my wife, I said, did you teach this boy how to lie? She said, no, I don't lie. I'm not going to teach him how to lie. I said, Nicole, did you teach him how to lie? No, Dad. I said, okay, so here's the reality. How come my 18-month-old son, who was never taught to lie, looks me square in the face and lies? Adamic nature. Does everybody understand that? Seth was born in the image of Adam. Every man after that, after the fall, was born in the image of Adam, not the image of God. But Jesus came and said what? You must be why? Because he came to restore the image of God in man. Oh, can I teach you that? This is really important we get this. Here's the reality. Watch. Zacchaeus, the little guy, the tax collector, is in a tree. Right? Why? Because he wants to see Jesus. Everybody knows the story, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. <laughs> Never mind. It's a song. <laughs> okay. So in that place, he climbs into the sycamore tree Why? to see Jesus. And Zacchaeus is looking, and Jesus locks eyes with him. Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house for dinner. And they're like, oh, you're going to the chair. And everybody's complaining, all the religious folks. 
That hasn't changed. Uh, so, <laughs> but, but in the midst of that, here's what happens. Jesus makes a statement. What's he say? The sick are the ones that need a physician, not those that are well. And he said, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Everybody get that? And you can read that in a lot of different versions. And it doesn't say he came to seek and save those who were lost. It's not those who, it's that which. What was lost? The image of God in man was lost. And Jesus came to restore the image of God in man once again. That we could look like Jesus and become sons and daughters of the Most High God. And bear his image on the earth. He came to restore man to that place. That's amazing to me. That's good news. In that restoration comes all kind of amazing things. Luke 10 and 19 tells me something. Go there. Luke 10, right? Probably verse 1. He sent them out two by two into every city and village, right? And he gave them authority. Let's look. I wanna, can I show you a whole bunch of stuff in Luke 10 because it's kind of neat? I'm actually going to get to 1 Samuel 17. And all my Bible scholars went, really? Okay, yes. <laughs> I, I, I had no intention of going this way until we were in the middle of worship. But, but I'm feeling something strong from the Lord right now. So let's just go. But go with me to Luke chapter 10 for just a second. Because it's important that we get this part. This is really important. Verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also. And he sent them two and two before his face into every city and place where he himself would come. Everybody got that? He sent them out two by two. Everybody get that? Now, go to verse 17, right? And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject to us through your name. Now, in the King James' devils, the Greek, the, the Greek language there would actually be demons, okay? And he says, even the people who are demonized are being set free. I think this is amazing. Can I teach you something that's going to really stretch your theology a minute? Do you know that I'm still reading Old Testament scriptures? He said, no, pastor, you're in Luke. Luke's gospel's in the New Testament. Only the last chapter. Actually, only the last chapter of Matthew is in the New Covenant. Why? Because the New Covenant doesn't come until Jesus sheds his blood. Does that make sense? He sheds his blood and pours his blood out on the mercy seat, and the New Covenant comes, right? But really, Matthew's 28 chapters and the first 27 are under the Old Covenant. Jesus lived under an Old Covenant. Do you understand that? But he walks with authority, and he's giving authority as he goes. And he gave them authority, and now because of the authority he gave them, watch, even the demons are subject to us. The blood hasn't been shed. Has everybody got what I just said? That's really important that we get this. But he gave them authority. Why do you say it's important? Because I want you to understand he's given you authority. But you've got authority under a new covenant, which has to be better than authority even under an old covenant. Why? Because the Bible tells me this is a better covenant. That means I got everything from the old covenant plus more. Yeah! People say, I don't need to study the old covenant. Yeah, you do, because you got a better covenant, and the new covenant couldn't be better unless it included everything that you got from the old covenant plus more. I got it all. If you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed, and you're heirs according to the promise. That's good stuff to me. So watch what happens. This gets really powerful. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I want to talk to you. Why does he say, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven? Can I talk to you? Some of you know this story, but Satan was named Lucifer. He was the archangel that covers in charge of music in heaven from what we can gather. And then he got puffed up. And here's what happened. He got acting up and they had to kick him out of their territory. Is that okay if I say it that way? I beheld Satan, we kicked him out, right? He said, I beheld Satan fall as lightning from heaven. What? We took authority over him and kicked him out of heaven, and now I'm giving you authority. You can kick him out of your territory just like we kicked him out of our territory. Why? Because you got authority over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. <sighs> we kicked him out of our territory, you ought to be kicking him out of yours. Whew, glory. That's the word of God for you. That's the word of God for you. See, when you read that in the King James, behold, I give you power. The first word power is exousia. The Greek word is exousia. And, and it says over all the power of the enemy. And that word's dunamis. But the first word exousia means authority. I'm giving you authority over all the 
dunamis power. The word dunamis was where we get dynamite from. People say, oh, the devil don't have any power. Well, Jesus said he did. But he said, you got authority over his power. What's that mean? All right? I'm 18 years old. I'm a boxer for the Butler Cubs. I boxed silver gloves, not golden gloves. But at that point, I was a pretty strong, healthy, strong boy. And working out at the Butler YMCA. And that's the town I grew up in. And there's a guy there that was an Olympic weightlifter. His name was Coyle Lamison. Coyle Lamison looked like an oak tree with legs. <laughs> like just like that from the waist up. <laughs> and the guy's huge, man. He's bench pressing like 450 pounds doing reps with it. That's like ridiculous in my world. Huge guy. And Coyle was born again and handed out tracks. Who remembers when we used to hand out tracks all the time? He'd hand out tracks. Here's the deal. When Coyle Lamison said, here, take a track, you said, yes, sir, please just don't hit me. Okay. <laughs> Because he was huge. His muscles had muscles. <laughs> so Coyle, and he drove a Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> I promise you, this is, I can't even make this stuff up, right? He drove a Volkswagen Beetle, right? So out near Butler, we have a highway. It's called 422, and sometimes we call it four double deuce. You need to catch that because it's important in the story, okay? He's coming down the road. He, he comes into the Y one day, and this guy was like a gentle giant, man. I mean, he's just a pretty nice guy all the time. He come in, and he come into a locker room, and I seen him in the locker room, and he slammed his locker. I never seen him do that before. I thought, whoa. You know what happens when a guy that big slams a locker? You hide. <laughs> just back into the wall somewhere and let him go by. So he's over, and Coyle always lifted free weights. I did the machines, the Nautilus machines, if you know what I mean. He did the free weights all the time, and he's dropping his free weight. But he never did. He'd always set them down pretty easy, and it's like boom. And when a guy's dropping as much weight as Coyle lifted, it's a lot of weight, and boom, and the whole place is shaking. And we're talking, but nobody wants to approach this guy because he's really big. <laughs> you just don't want to mess with him when he's mad. But I've never seen him mad before. After a while, he calmed down. I walked over to him. He's probably about 26 years old. I walked over to him, and I said, hey, buddy, what's going on, man? You, you doing okay? He said, ah, no. And he was mad. And I, I said, what, what's going on? And he said, I'm coming down four double deuce. And he said, I look in the mirror and the lights are on behind me. And he said, I pull my car over. And this little five-foot girl gets out of her police car, walks up to my window, and starts pointing her finger and shaking it at me. Tells me I was speeding. He said, I don't know if I was or not. But, man, she had such an attitude. And he said, I looked at her and I thought, woman, I could pick you up throw you over the hill, and no one will find you for three days. <laughs> Why? Because he's like 6'2", and massive, and she's five foot and less than 100 pounds. But you know what happened? He squirmed all in his car and took his ticket from her and said, thank you, ma'am, and went down the road. How does a five-foot little tiny woman make a six-foot-two massive weightlifter squirm? Because he got power, but she got authority. Oh, you need to hear me. Do you understand what I'm saying? She was authorized by the proper authority to make the strong man squirm. Uh, can I talk to your church and tell you, you have been authorized uh, and deputized uh, by the King of Kings uh, and the Lord of Lords uh, that when the enemy comes against you, you got a right to stand up and say, no way, devil, no way, devil. I don't have to take it, not one more day. You don't have a seat at my table. You don't have a bed in my house. Uh, you don't have a place in my home. You won't touch my kids. You won't touch my marriage. You won't touch my health uh, in the name of Jesus. I feel like preaching tonight. It's the choir's fault. I just feel Jesus in this place. Go with me to 1 Samuel 17. If I say 1 Samuel 17, my Bible scholars know we're looking at another familiar story tonight little boy named David in a bag of rocks. I want to walk you through. Sometimes we get too familiar and we miss what's going on. But I'll show you something you may have never seen before. So David has some brothers that join the Israeli army. They're in battle with the Philistines. And David's dad says, Take some bread and cheese, a little tomato sauce, you can make a pizza. <laughs> Go check on your brothers, see how they're doing. So David jumps in the carriage and makes his way. There's so much I could talk to you. 
Can I tell you something I think is important? Goliath. Goliath comes out. Do you know that Goliath doesn't come out once? He comes out for 40 days. You guys know this? He's nine foot nine inches tall. If you understand that, he, it said he's six cubits tall. If you read it, he's got six pieces of armor, and his, the weight of his spearhead is 600 shekels. 666. Six, six. Think Goliath represented something? You need to understand this. Goliath represents everything that hell could throw against the children of God. I, I'll show you that a little deeper just as we go along. But don't miss what's going on in this story. In the midst of all that, look what happens. Verse 22, David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage, and he ran to the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion of the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. Okay, I've got to stop and explain this. Where's Goliath from? Gath. What's Gath? Gath is the capital city of Philistia, okay? And Philistia is one of the ten cities of the Decapolis, and I won't even get into all that. But here's the reality. Gath is like their capital city. And Goliath is their champion. And he comes to them, and he makes this, this challenge. Choose you a man that he might come and fight with me. If he prevails over me, we'll be your slaves. But if I prevail over him, you'll be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel. Choose you a man that he might come and fight with me. Do you know what I can tell you? Satan's out to make slaves any way he can. And I'm going to tell you something. You're either a slave to righteousness or you're a slave to the devil. And you say, well, you know, I'm kind of on the fence. Can I tell you something? The devil owns the fence. <laughs> Boy, that's a word for somebody right now. So the challenge is out there. And he spake unto them, choose your men, let him come and fight with me. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him. And they were so afraid. And the men of Israel said, if you've seen this man that's come up, surely to defy Israel as he come up. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches. Give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Everybody catch that? Kill this giant, there's a reward. What's the reward? Be enriched with great riches? You'll marry the king's daughter and your father's house will be free from tax. That sounds like a good plan if you live in America. <laughs> but here's the reality. David caught the vision. Look at the next verse. David spake to the men by him, saying, what shall be done? To the man that kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that kills him. What happened? David heard this. The man who kills the king's, the, the giant would be enriched with great riches, marry the king's daughter, and your father's house would be free from tax. What'd you say? Say what, boss? What'd you say? And they said, Oh, the man who kills this giant would be enriched with great riches, marry the king's daughter, father's house be free from tax. And David said, Dude. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Do you understand when he said uncircumcised? Circumcision was a mark of the covenant, right? The Jewish people had a covenant with God, and that mark of the covenant was circumcision. And David said, he's uncircumcised. He don't even have a covenant. Whew. Who hears me? Do you understand you have a covenant? Amen. Cool. Sometimes we got to remember we're in covenant with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Sometimes you got to understand. Do you know why he's called the king of kings? Because you're called kings. And he's the king of kings. Oh. David said, I got a covenant. <laughs> and he ain't got a covenant. They said, that giant's too big to kill. David said, that giant's too big to miss. <laughs> Come on. Oh. Sometimes you got to realize. Watch what happens. Eliab, his oldest brother, when he, when, he heard, when he spake to these men, heard him, right? 
Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the man. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why you come down here? And who'd you leave them few sheep with in the wilderness? I know your pride and the naughtiness of your heart. You're just come down that you might see the battle. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former matter. Why? Do you understand what just happened? Eliab, his oldest brother, come down and said, what are you doing here, runt? Who'd you leave them few measly sheep with? And you just come down here because you just all nosy and want to know what's going on. And you know what happened? David blew him off completely. You know what happened? David looked at his brother, and here's what he really said. I'm not moved by who you think I am. I know who I am. Right. Whew, sometimes your family don't know who you are. Sometimes the people around you might not know who you are, but you're not who they say you are. You're who God says you are. Oh, hallelujah. And he said, oh, there's a place where I know whose I am and whom I serve. There's an anointing on my life, and I'm about to rise up into that place. Somebody in the house is about to rise up into an anointing you didn't even know you had. Sure. David said, I'm not being moved by what you say. And he turned back and he said, now, what would you say that reward was? What did they say? You'd be enriched with great riches. I think that lit a light. But here's where the real light comes on. You'll marry the king's daughter. Why does that matter to David? Because a little while ago, there's a man named Samuel showed up at their house. Whew. Samuel had a horn of oil. He was the prophet of the Most High God. He was God's mouthpiece for Israel. And he came to Jesse's house, said, I'm here to anoint a new king. Saul's about to go down, and God's raising somebody up, and he sent me to your house. And Jesse said, whoo-hoo, I got some boys. Probably Eliab, he's the eldest. So he calls Eliab in, but Eliab ain't the one. And then he calls six more. And seven, who hears me? Seven sons of Jesse passed before the prophet. And he said, ain't no king here. I ain't feeling it. You got any more sons? Said, I got one back there in the field. Little runt boy keeps sheep. And he said, I, We ain't eating dinner till I see that boy. David come in. He said, I'm number eight. Whew. Do you know eight's the number of new beginnings? Oh, there might be somebody in here right now, and you're number eight. Oh, you might even get that on your spirit. I'm a number eight child. It doesn't mean you're the eighth in your family, but you're saying, I'm a child of a new beginning. My family's been down some rough road, but I'm the child that's going to start a new beginning in my family. Oh, my family might have been through some tough places. I'm the child that's going to start something new. Oh, my family served the devil for years, but I'm here tonight to, to claim I'm number eight. I'm a child of new beginnings. I'm a child that's a about to take out the devil and set Jesus as the king of my family. Why? Because sometimes you just got to be a number eight. See, when that prophet poured that oil on that boy's head, he was proclaiming him to be the next king. But in the culture of the day, how did you get to be king? Well, the king would make the people in his family the next king. Who remembers when David's dying, he's anointing Solomon. Everybody got this, right? David ain't got kingly lineage. How am I going to get in the king's family? Wait a minute, what'd you say? Enriched with great riches. Oh, marry the king's daughter. <laughs> Whew. Why? Because a little shepherd boy ain't got a chance to marry king's daughter unless he kills a giant. I'm just a shepherd boy with a rock in my pocket. Can I tell you something? If you've got a giant, God's got a stone. And he'll put a stone in your hand. I want to teach you some things tonight because it gets really important here. I love this stuff. Let me just give you the Reader's Digest version until we get to another spot. They, 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 come to, they, they, they come to Saul and say, hey, we got somebody ain't afraid of the giant. Who you got? Who you got? Somebody big, somebody large, somebody really rough and tough. No, nope, got about a 17-year-old boy out there. He's a little runt. <laughs> Saul looks and says, dude, you're just a kid. 
And he's, a, he's, been, he's been a warrior longer than you've been born. David said, I killed a lion and a bear. Can I tell you something? Maybe before you chase some giants, you need to kill some lions and some bears. I pastor a pretty good church. We've got a lot of amazing people. And I give a lot of opportunity for folks to preach, and I like doing that. In the midst of that, some people want to preach the Sunday morning service, and you know what I tell them? Preach the Wednesday night first. Why? Because you've got to kill some giants or some, some, some lions and some bears before you take on some giants. Does that make sense to anybody? In the midst of all that, here's what's going on. And, and don't hear me wrong. You can get born again tonight and raise the dead tomorrow. Do you guys know this? Because it's the gospel. I, I, I talked last night, a friend of mine, David Hogan, right? He's seen a lot of people raised from the dead. Uh, 540 some now in their ministry. That's about 540 some more than me. <laughs> but, but, but that's not just that's not David, that's the whole ministry. David tells me about 36 or 37 by his own hand. But here's the reality. They prayed for a whole lot that didn't raise too, by the way. But there was a... a, a What's the it, war, not war, witch doctor? There was a witch doctor that had come against the ministry really, really deep. Like it was a really bad deal. There was a lot of sickness and things going on in the village, and they knew it was this witch doctor, and he was coming against David's ministry. And here's what happened the witch doctor's boy came to one of David's meetings uh, to kind of do some bad stuff and ended up encountering God and getting born again. It's pretty exciting. And the kid got, he didn't get saved, he got saved, because there's a difference. <laughs> he got radically encountered God, and he gets radically saved, and he goes home, and his dad's furious and mad and says something and falls over dead. The witch doctor fell over dead. You know what the boy did? Grabbed his dad, put him on his lap, and started praying, Jesus, I know you're real, and you can make my dad alive again. And he said for six hours, he rocked like this back and forth with his dad. He rocked back and forth with his dad saying, Jesus, I know you're real and you can make my father alive again. Do you know what happened? After six hours, the dad woke up with this look on his face and he's petrified. And he said, son, you got to tell me about the man in white who came to me. He said, ask your son. He's just encountered me and he'll tell you who I am. It was Jesus. So watch, a boy gets born again at night and the next day raises his father from the dead. That's a good day. Why? Because this gospel is real. Amen. I think that stuff's awesome. In the midst of all that, David tells Saul, I killed a lion. A lion came to eat my sheep and I killed him. And a bear came and I killed him. And the same God that delivered me from the paw of the lion in the mouth of the bear, or the paw of the bear in the mouth of the lion, he'll deliver this giant into my hands. Saul said, Well, here, here's my armor. Do you know why Saul was the king? Do you guys know this? They, they picked Saul to be king because he's head and shoulders above everybody else. Now, that's not a dandruff commercial, <laughs> he's just a big guy. And you got little David trying to put on Saul's arm. How dumb does that? Do you guys get visual? Like when I read my Bible, I'm incredibly visual, right? So I see it all in pictures. When I was a kid, I ate crayons. So now the pictures are all in color. <laughs> but, but if you watch this stuff, man, I'm picturing David trying to wear Saul. This is crazy. And David puts it off and says, I can't wear that. So I want you to see verse 40. So David put him off, right? He says, I'm not going to wear that armor. Verse 40. He took his staff in his hand, and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and he put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Okay? So he took out five stones, right? And he put them in a leather bag. Here's what I want you to understand. Everything you read in the Bible is there for a reason and a purpose. Everybody all right? Amen. Everything in there is on purpose. David chose out five smooth stones. Everybody see it? It's kind of interesting. I don't know if everybody knows this. Maybe some of you know. I thought, Lord, what in the world would David take five stones? Is he afraid he's going to miss? Do you guys know this? 2 Samuel 21 will tell you this. You can mark that in your Bible on the side note, 2 Samuel 21. Goliath had four brothers. David's mighty men killed the other four giants that were brothers to Goliath. And I think he took five stones because he figured, here's a stone for Goliath, and if your brothers are on the other side of the hill, i got one rock for every one of them too. <laughs> But every word's on purpose. 
He didn't just choose five stones. He chose five smooth stones. Isn't it interesting that God said they were smooth? Where did he get them from? Out of the brook. How do stones get smooth? Can I tell you? Sure. He chose out smooth stones. Why? Because if you have a stone that's all cracked all over and got, and got stuff sticking out of it, it won't fly perfect. But if you have a smooth stone, it'll fly aerodynamically correct. Whew. See, they don't make a plane with stuff sticking out of it everywhere. They make a plane smooth so that it flies aerodynamically. Does everybody follow what I'm saying? He chose smooth stones because he wanted them to fly right so that they would make their mark and hit their target. But what made the stones smooth? They'd been in the brook. And some of them might have been in the brook for a long time. And you know what happened in the brook? Pressure. Pressure kept going over them stones. Pressure kept going over them stones. Pressure kept going over them stones. But they were under pressure for a long time. Why? So that they could accomplish what God purposed them to have. Uh, can I talk to you? You might be in the house today and you've been under pressure for a while. But I'm here to tell you, God will use that pressure. Why? All the pressure you've been under is just to make you fit for what God wants to accomplish in your life and when you come through I'm here to tell you nothing you've been through is going to be wasted God is not a God of waste but a God of purpose and intent the pressure that you might have been going through was to set you up for success I told you I was a boxer can I tell you something boxers don't become champions in the ring They get crowned in the ring. They become champions in their training. They're only recognized in their ring. It was the months and months and months of training that set them up. They were already champions when they walked in the ring. They were just crowned when they got in the ring. You might be in the midst of a battle right now. But I promise you, the pressure you're going through right now is to set you up for success, not failure. I promise you, he's faithful. Man, I hear that for somebody right now. You might be under pressure. You just got to know God's taking the rough edges off of you. God's taking the rough, rough edges off of you. Why? So that you can fly aerodynamically correct. Why? Because you got a target, and God is intending to use you to take out some giants. Whew. Man, I feel that really, really strong right now. Whew, glory. Some of you are like, man, I've been under pressure for years. <laughs> I ought to be really smooth. <laughs> Oh. He chose out five smooth stones. You guys know the story, right? So here's what happens. Let's read. The Philistine came on and he drew near to David. And the men that bear the shield went before him. The Philistine looked about. He saw David. He disdained him. He was just a youth and ruddy, a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that you would come to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, you come to me and I'll give your flesh to the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. Everybody see that? It's called intimidation. Can I say this? The devil's greatest tool is intimidation. I'm going to talk to you really plain tonight. You see somebody in tremendous pain and you know the Bible says you got authority to lay hands on them and they can be healed. Why don't we just run to them right away? Because we're intimidated. What do they think? What if they don't want prayer? What if I pray for them and nothing happens? What if you pray for them and something does happen? I pray for a whole lot of people. I love praying for people in public. I pray for waitresses all the time. I made a lot of friends in the waitress business. We eat a lot of meals out. Whew. They said, what's your wife like to make for dinner? I said, reservations. <laughs> Glad she's not here tonight. I can say anything I want. Okay. <laughs> Don't you tell her. Okay. <laughs> Here's the reality. Oh. Not everybody I pray for gets healed, but everybody I pray for gets loved. Man, that's got to become a mantra for somebody. Not everybody I pray for gets healed, but everybody I pray for gets loved. Come on. I never heard anybody say, I got too many people loving me. Nobody's ever told me that. I think there's a place where we just reach out by love. I don't want to be intimidated by what somebody else might think, say, or do. I want to do what God called me to do and be who God called me to be. The devil wants to intimidate you just like Goliath was trying to intimidate David. What's David's response? Then said David to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, 
the God of armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day the Lord's going to deliver you into my hand, and I will smite you and take your head from you. Everybody see that? And I'll give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day to the fowls of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Oh, I love that verse. I'll smite you and take your head from you. Oh. Do you know what he did? Smote him and took his head. I want you to see this. This gets so cool, okay? Let's just read and then I'm going to preach, okay? Is that all right? No. Oh. And all this assembly shall know the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. He'll give you into our hands. It came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, David hasted and he ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. It's amazing that all the army of Israel was running from Goliath except for David who was running toward him. Why? I believe that God is raising up some people, and I'm going to call you one percenters, who won't run from the battle, but will run straight into the battle. Why? Because you know the battle's not yours, it's the Lord's. I I believe that God is raising up some believers that actually believe. I believe that there's believing believers in this house who are ready to say, come on, it's game on. It's game on. I'm not going to sit on the sideline and watch. Oh, this is a contact sport, and everybody on the field. Sure. David said, I'm not afraid, and he ran straight at that Goliath. I love this stuff. Watch what happened. I feel really Pentecostal tonight. (laughs) Glory. David put his hand in his bag, and he took a stone and slang it. He smote the Philistine in his forehead, and the stone sunk in the forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he smote the Philistine and slew him, but there wasn't a sword in the hand of David. Everybody see it? Whack! <laughs> Smote him right in the forehead. That old giant went timber. Crunk. I told you I'm really visual. I gotta watch this stuff. When Goliath hit the ground, that was a great day. David ran and jumps on his chest, but he don't have a sword. Why don't you see what happened? Therefore, David ran and stood on the Philistine and took his sword, took Goliath's sword, drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him and cut off his head therewith. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they took off running. Everybody see it? I love this stuff. He took Goliath's own sword, cut his head off. Wow! Phew. I read that a few times. I said, Lord, he cut his head off. And the Lord said, sometimes you just got to silence the voice of the enemy. Cut his head off. Cut his head off. Sure. Sometimes you just got to shut the devil up. (sighs) Cut his head off. I thought that was really powerful. But here's something. You have to understand culture, okay? So let me teach you culture because now this is where it gets really fun for me. I love this part, okay? So the men of Israel and Judah arose and they shouted and they pursued the Philistines, right? And they chased them all down and all that kind of cool stuff. (sighs) Verse 54. This is what I love. David took the head of the Philistine and he brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. That's so cool. What did he do? He took Goliath's head to Jerusalem. Why? Culture. You have to understand the Hebrew culture. You have to understand the culture of biblical times. When you prevailed over your enemy, you know what they did? If they, if they beat a, a, a king, you know what they did? They took the king's head, cut it off, they put it on a stick. And they'd hold it way up high. And they'd have a parade. Right? Why? That's my enemy. That's the head of my enemy. God has delivered my enemy into my hand. Do you guys understand that? So what David did there is not unusual. That was part of their culture. They would take the head. And where did he take the head? Took the head into Jerusalem, and there's a parade. Right? And I mean, they're excited. And I'm thinking, they're throwing confetti and babies in the air, and they're shouting and dancing, and it's really exciting and fun, and all kind of cool stuff is going on. And they're having a parade, wahoo, and music playing, and I don't know what all was going on, but they had this great parade. Why? Because ding dong, the witch is dead. Witch, oh, witch, Goliath. Okay? So, so it's a good day. And they're excited. Here's what I want you to know culture, understand. David. Takes the head of Goliath into the city. They have the parade. What do you do with it afterward? Do you understand the culture of the day? The Hebrew culture is very big on clean and unclean. It's a dead thing. When it's dead, do you know that when something's dead in the Hebrew culture, it's still in the Middle Eastern, Eastern days, you got 24 hours to get it in the ground? Do you guys know this? Like when Lazarus died, they didn't wait for Jesus to come to the funeral. 
Why? Because you've got to get them in the ground in 24 hours. You guys know this? This is just, it's, it's, it's culture. You can study it. You can Google it. Do whatever you want to. It's right. But here's the reality. See, they couldn't wait for Jesus to come to a funeral because every time he went to a funeral, he messed them up. <laughs> every time Jesus went to a funeral, he messed it up. Do you guys get that? <laughs> okay. So here's the real. They bring the head of Goliath in. They have the parade. Now you've got 24 hours to bury that thing. They've got to get rid of it. Now, understand culture. Do you bury it in the city or outside the city? You can't bury it inside the city. Why? Because inside the city is clean. Outside the city is burial. Everybody got that? Got to take it outside the city, and they got to bury it. Everybody remember this? Okay. Now, whose head? Goliath's. Everybody got that? Where's Goliath from? Go to John 19. It's important we get this. In John, the 19th chapter, we're finding that Jesus has been arrested, beaten, whipped. I talked about a lot of it last night. Verse 16, then delivered he them therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and they led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. The place of what? A skull. I believe that Golgotha was called Golgotha. It was the place where they buried the head of Goliath of Gath. And there in that place, Goliath, who represented everything that hell could throw against the children of God, everything that hell could bring against the children of Israel, God's people, was defeated and his head was buried outside the city of Jerusalem. Why? Because his head was inside the city. They had to go outside the city to bury it. It was called the place of a skull. The head of Goliath is buried there. A thousand years later, come on, David takes out the giant. A thousand years later, one called the son of David, right? Come on, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, come on, right? The son of David would go to that same place and shed his blood. Why? As a blood covering, and it covered everything that hell could possibly throw against the children of God. (laughs) That place that represented hell and all that hell could bring against you is now covered by the blood. What's that mean? That means that you've been anointed, that you You've been covered by the blood, that you've been authorized and deputized, and you have power and authority over everything that hell could possibly bring against you, that anything that comes against you, do you understand that you've been authorized by the King of Kings, uh, that hell has no power or authority over you? The blood of Jesus has redeemed you and set you free. Why? Because Jesus would go to Golgotha and shed his blood for you to have victory over death, victory over hell, victory over the grave. Jesus stands forth in Revelation to John the Revelator. I am he that was dead and now I'm alive and I got the keys of death and hell and I'm alive forevermore. Sure. He'll never have to shed that blood again. Why? Because he paid the price. If he gave you victory over death, that means you're never going to die. Glory. Sure. Do you understand the power and authority that's in your life? You just got to believe it. You actually have to believe that that power and that authority is on you. I can't get away from this stuff, man. See, here's what I found. The more I get this thing in me, the more confident I get when I'm out on the street. You see these things, you can go after that. Why? Because you know who you are. If you don't know who you are, the devil will always have somebody to tell you who you are. But if you know who you are, why? Because God's already told you who you are. It doesn't matter what their voice says. Why? My sheep know my voice, and another voice they will not follow. The power of understanding our authority as believers has got to come back to the church again. Do you understand the early church understood that authority? to the place where they weren't afraid of anything. They were fearless. I believe God's raising up a fearless generation. What's it look like to actually stand forth and declare, be healed in Jesus' name. Be set free in Jesus' name.
Do you understand that all over America we have institutions filled, de- filled with demonized people? We call them mental institutes. And they don't have a mental problem, they have a demon problem. Why? Because I believe every sickness and every disease comes straight from hell. Listen, I'm just going to talk to you really plain. There's people that I've met that believe that, well, sometimes God lets us be sick. Sometimes God makes us sick so he can teach us character. If I'm his child and he's making me sick on purpose, then that's called child abuse. I don't think he's a child abuser. Do you understand what I just said? Come on. Come on. We have a, we have a core value at Harvest that says God is always good and the devil's always bad. Amen. And anything less than good isn't God. So please hear this, man. Because if you believe, watch, I just did a funeral. I don't even know if I talked about this last night, but I just did a funeral for a stillborn baby. Right? I go to the funeral home, and there's all the family, and they're gathering around saying, well, you know, God has a purpose for everything he does, and he, he just he needed another angel in heaven. And I looked at that lady, and I said, if I serve a God who can't tell the difference between a baby and an angel, I quit. <laughs> well, come on. First of all, you don't become angels. Come on. You're not going to die and spread wings and fly around on some cloud with a harp. That's a white cloud commercial. (laughs) God is always good. And the devil's always bad. And if you believe that God is sometimes good and sometimes bad, then every time something bad happens. Listen, can I tell you something that's real? The Bible says that God is the accuser of the brethren before, or the devil is the accuser of the brethren before God. Does it say that? Can I tell you something else? He's the accuser of God before the brethren. The devil will do bad, stupid stuff and then blame God and try to get God's people mad at God. Can I tell you, the church is full of people that are mad at God for stuff the devil did and God had nothing to even do with. But see, we got taught, oh, I'm going to go on a tangent now, but it's okay. Because here's the reality. We got taught that God's sovereign and everything that happens is the will of God. Can I tell you something? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bust on that sovereignty thing. The Bible tells me that the heaven, even the heavens belong unto thee, O Lord, but the earth has he given to the sons of men. When he makes Adam and Eve, what's he say? Let us make man in our own image after our own likeness and let them have dominion. What did he say? Let them have dominion. He didn't say let us have dominion. That's why Jesus has to become a man. Why? He becomes a man. Why? Because man had dominion on the earth. Whew. So in the midst of all that, you understand everything Jesus does, he does as a man. In a right relationship with the Father, empowered by the Holy Spirit. You guys got that? Because if we miss that, we miss everything. See, I used to think, well, I can't be like Jesus because he was God. I'm going to walk with this, okay? If I believe that, then I'll live powerless my entire life. But if I believe that everything Jesus did, he does as a man, (laughs) in a right relationship with the Father, empowered by the Holy Spirit, right? Now I have a model that I can follow. Everybody got that? Now watch, okay, because watch, if I believe that everything Jesus did, he did because he's God, I don't have a model, but if everything he did is he is God, here's the deal, James chapter 1, you know what it says? Let no man say, when I'm tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God tempteth no man, neither can he be tempted with evil. Does it say that? God can't be tempted with evil, but Matthew 4 and Luke 4 both say the same thing in the first verse. It says, and Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. If God can't be tempted then Jesus must have done it as a man. Everybody hear what I just said? Okay, let me take you a little step further. Acts 10 and 38 is the New Testament in one verse. You know what it says? How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now watch, if he's God, he doesn't need to be anointed by the Holy Ghost. He is the Holy Ghost. (laughs) And God isn't with him, and he's God. But it says he's anointed, come on, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Why? Because God was with him. Why? Because he does it as a man in a right relationship with the Father, empowered by the Holy Spirit. That means, come on, Acts 10 and 38 can actually say how God anointed Tom of Lake City with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil because God was with Tom. Oh, you can do this thing. Why? Because Jesus is his Lord and he lives inside of you and you have been authorized and empowered from heaven to walk this thing out in reality. Oh, I feel that T.D. Jakes in the way. <laughs> There's something that's rising in my spirit right now. We've got to be believers that actually believe. We've got to be believers that actually believe. Mark chapter 9, this boy is demonized. 
It's Matthew 17 and Mark 9. I think they're the same story from right. Let's do it from Matthew 17. Look at it from there if you want to. You got Peter, James, and John on the mountain with Jesus. Am I right? It's the Mount of Transfiguration. And while they're up there, this father shows up with his boy who's demonized. Let me take you there. Go to Matthew 17. Go ahead and look at it. And the boy, the father brings the, the Jesus in the, and Peter, James, and John come down off the mountain. And the father comes to, the, to Christ and he says, I brought my son to your disciples because he's got a demon in him. But they couldn't cast him out. And Jesus goes, bring the boy to me. And he brings the boy to Jesus. And here's what happens. Oh, He brings the boy to Jesus. Jesus actually says, how long has he been like this? I think that's amazing that he even asked that question. Like, what's the difference? He's about to go. <laughs> like, the demon's going to encounter Jesus. This is not a battle. It's like when you flip a light switch on, there's no battle between light and dark. Light just happens. Like you never flip the light switch and then watch to see maybe it'll come on, maybe it won't. There's going to be a fight. Oh, there's a little light. Oh, no, it's back. It's dark. It's not like this cosmic battle. What? Zoom, light. Boom. Darkness flees. You know how to get rid of darkness? Turn on the light. Oh, there's a whole sermon right there. Oh. How long has this boy been like this? You know what? I think I, I believe he asked this question like this. This boy suffered a long time and he never had to if we'd have been what we were called to be. When the church rises up in our authority and power, no one has to suffer. I actually am excited for the day when people don't run to the emergency room, they run to the church. I think it'd be a good day when your church is lined up with ambulances. I think it'd be a good day when somebody dies and they call... Is this Christian Fellowship Church? Yeah. Is your dead raising team available? <sighs> Come on. Come on. Wouldn't it be great? You guys have windbreakers, DRT, dead raising team. <laughs> Come on. Who are you going to call? Dead raisers. <laughs> okay. Come on. <sighs> I think it's a great plan because I think the church ought to be walking in this kind of authority. Because why? Because Jesus said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. <sighs> I'm okay with that. How long has this boy been like this? Right? I think that's huge. Watch what happens. Verse 15 of that chapter, Lord have mercy on my son. He's lunatic, sore vex. Oftentimes he falls into fire, off into water. I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't cure him. Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation. Everybody see that? The word perverse there literally translates twisted thinking. What does it mean? Your, tw your thinking got twisted. Why? The devil twisted your thinking. I believe that this boy was manifested and the disciples were freaked out because they'd already, caused, they'd already cast devils out. They'd already seen people that were demonized get delivered. But this one didn't happen. Everybody got that? Okay. You watch. Your thinking got twisted. Everybody follow that? That's what that means, perverted, twisted thinking. Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why couldn't we cast them out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your, come on, what did he say? Unbelief. Unbelief. So what's Jesus talking about right now? Unbelief. All right, now watch. Verily I say unto you, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you'd say to a mountain, remove hence, and, 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 hence to yonder place, and it should remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Now, I preached this for years, and I missed it. What was he talking about? He wasn't talking about the demon. Because I preached and said, some demons are more powerful than others, and you've got to be prayed up and fasting if you're going to cast out those demons. He wasn't even talking about that. He's talking about unbelief. And he said, it's unbelief that kept that demon from coming out. And if you want to get rid of unbelief, pray and fast. And in your prayer and fasting, you get intimate with God. And the more intimate with God, the more unbelief gets out of you. And when unbelief is out of you, nothing's left but belief. Prayer and fasting is what he was talking about. Prayer and fasting gets rid of unbelief. And unbelief is what's holding the church back from becoming everything God created us to be. 
That's good preaching, brother. Amen. <laughs> oh. Listen, this is huge to get rid of unbelief and actually become who God called us to be. That literally you can't walk by somebody in pain and not lay your hand on them. People that need healing, deliverance, set free. They've been demonized. They're alcoholics, drug addicts. I honestly believe we have the cure. They say, well, there's no cure for AIDS. I know one. His name's Jesus. Pastor Dan's all the time doing redemption altar calls. We get emails. I don't know if you guys know, but we get his emails. Crazy stuff. People that had hep C and all kinds of different things. And they go back to the doctors, and the doctors run test after test because you don't get rid of hep C. Well, (laughs) not in the natural. But they're completely set free, cured, brand new, like they never even had it. You know why? That's what redemption says. Do you understand? Redemption says it's like it never even happened. If his blood, can I say this? His blood doesn't just remove your sin. It will remove the effects of sin. So if a bad choice caused you to get a blood disease like hep C, right, then a good choice (laughs) like Jesus won't just get rid of my sin, it'll get rid of all the effects of that sin as well. We have watched people that were cutters and had scars all over their body, and the scars disappeared right before your eyes. That'll freak you out, I promise you. That's just messed up. That's just fun. (laughs) Why? Redemption, like as if it never even happened. And all of a sudden, your skin's brand new. That'll, oh, I'm telling you, you can't see that and not bawl your eyes out. Why? Because Jesus is Lord. Please hear me. He's Lord. Stand with me all over the house. Man, I feel Jesus right now. Oh. Do you understand? The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus sets a man free. John's gospel, I'm pretty sure it's chapter 7, somewhere around verse 38, if I'm right. It's going to be real close there. It says, and you shall know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Here's the deal. Truth isn't a concept. Truth is a person. His name's Jesus. You'll know the truth. But see, truth doesn't set you free. The truth you know sets you free. Because when you were in bondage, truth was still truth. It wasn't until you came to know the truth that the truth could set you free. The word know there, by the way, is the Greek word epinosa. It means to experience or to encounter. It's the truth you experience. It's the truth you encounter that's going to set you free. Man, I feel God in this place right now. There's a sweetness of his spirit. Get ready.